Welcome. Um, so we are officially going to kick off this evening's call at 6.05. Um, and I am thrilled to introduce everybody to Steven and Zuzi of Genetic Yoga, um, which they are waving. And feel free to uh, take yourself or put yourself on video if you'd like. Um, this meeting is being recorded, just so you know. Uh, my name is Rashina. I am the director and manager of events at the Alchemist Kitchen. Um, so at the current moment, I'm continuing to build out online events, but also in real life events. Um, before we go forward, I'm going to give a little plug to Stephen, who's going to be with us this Friday at the Alchemist Kitchen um, at our 117 Crosby Street location. I think after this call, um, you'll certainly want to work with him. He's incredible. Um, he's definitely a really lovely, thoughtful present um, in, her, in our space, um, in the physical space. He makes little visits, which is really nice. But if it's your first time joining us, I'd love to quickly take you through the Alchemist Kitchen and what our mission is. Um, so the Alchemist Kitchen originated as a botanical dispensary right off the Bowery in Manhattan, New York. Uh, we've evolved post COVID, but still very much in this pandemic, which we all know. Um, we are now located at 119 Crosby Street. That is our retail location. And then we have a state changing elixir bar, which is at 117 Crosby Street. And both of these locations really um, celebrate and pay much reverence to the power of plants. Uh, this is really a huge part of our ethos. Um, it's something that moves us and an extension of celebrating plants for elevated consciousness is aligning with uh, different, I guess, methodologies like human design, like astrology that really, you know, are here to help empower you, especially during times that are so fraught with like confusion and uncertainty. Um, I think human design, what I'm learning, I'm super new to this, but every time Steven comes into the space, I learn so many new incredible things. Uh, what I'm learning is that it sort of gives you a little bit more certainty or at least a little bit more self-trust. So um, I will hand it off to you guys uh, and I'm going to be on the call. I will have to take down my video because my internet connection is unfortunately unstable. Um, but I'm here the whole time, so if you guys have questions for me, don't hesitate to um, DM me in the chat. Thank you so much, Roshina. That was such a beautiful introduction. Yes, human design is a wonderful self-trust tool, and we have a little bit of a presentation for you all. So I am going to share my screen here and get us started. But before we do, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Juji. I am the moderator, I guess, for this evening, I should say, and I'm a co-creator of Genetic Yoga with Steven. So we're going to do this little presentation for you first, and then we will take questions. Uh, so I hope you brought yours. And I just wanted to start by introducing myself and saying that I met human design about three years ago at the Alchemist Kitchen. So I met Stephen there and he gave me a reading and it was a life-changing event uh, that snowballed into what you're witnessing right now. And I'm really, really, really excited to be here. It just feels so timely. So Stephen, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you met human design before you start us off? Absolutely. First of all, thank you all for coming. We're very, really excited for this turnout. Uh, very pleased. And to give a little introduction into my experience, uh, back in the summer of 1999, I was living on the island of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. And my girlfriend at the time befriended a woman who was just about 19 and her dad was one of the first professionals certified to teach human design from 
the original source. His name is Ra Uru Hu. And she got a reading directly from Ed and then uh, proceeded to badger me for the rest of the summer, insisting that I should also get one. And I was highly resistant until I got to know this individual, Ed, and uh, became friends with him and eventually came to an agreement to sit down and have a reading. And back then it was pretty raw. It was very new to the planet. This information first was introduced in the very first public lecture in February of 1992. Uh, my the person that introduced me, Ed, was the first round of 20 teachers certified to teach human design. And, and the first thing I found about it was that it was really interesting. And it wasn't really more than that, other than I wanted to know more. And after I met Ed, I got to meet the source of the information as he referred to himself as the first student of human design. We are all students of this knowledge. This knowledge came through a mystical event that he had and he has been, he started sharing it ever since then. He, he had his experience in 1987 and after he recovered from that experience in 92, he gave his first lecture. I met him in 99 and once I met him in Sedona, Arizona in the winter of December of 1999, then he became my direct teacher and I learned human design from him to his death in 2011 where I took in thousands of hours of lectures, uh, have 11 certifications in terms of being a professional. You can see someone behind me. And I've done probably over 5,000 readings at this point. So tonight, if you're brand new to human design, and I'm going to assume that everybody is, we're just going to really start off at the most surface level. So here's a few quotes to look at. I won't read them, you guys can. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to soak these in. And the first thing to really resonate to about human design that it's not a belief system. They're, the only leap of faith that I would say is part of it is getting the first reading. Because with your first introductory reading, you are introduced to what's called your strategy your strategy for how you're designed to make decisions correctly as yourself based on your time of birth, date, time, and place. That's the only information necessary in order to look at your, your map, your chart, and then to have it read. And then to experiment with what's called your inner authority. So you enter into all your decisions. And as we like to say, you're only as good as your last decision. And life is all about decision making. And if you always made a correct decision, you'd have a perfect life. So there's a strategy about how we're all designed to enter into decision. There's basically four strategies because there's only four types, which is what we're going to cover tonight. And then where your inner authority lies within your body. And one of the first places to really understand about human design is that your mind, who you think you think you are, what you have access to consciously in your head, is never a place of inner authority. Only your body can be a place of inner authority. Our minds are for each other and our bodies are for us. And as we say, it's the body's life. You live in form on this planet, very attached to this earth. If you don't have your health, you basically have nothing and to start the experiment. So what is human design made of? Well, human design is a synthesis of all the world's knowledges synthesized into one system. It's a complete system of information, of knowledge. So you're seeing the components here, the mystical aspects, the scientific aspects. Uh, it's a synthesis. When you look at the chart directly, you can see the nine chakra centers, the nine centers as we call them, the wheel, the I Ching wheel, which is the numbers on the outer ring the 64 gates, as we call them, and the Kabbalah, the Zohar, the tree of life that connects the chakra system. And it's used to orient the map in terms of where and when you were born. It uses the same mapping system as Eastern and Western astrology. 
and combined with astrophysics, the neutrino stream, subatomic particles, as they pass through us, this is the programming that we all receive universally and genetic DNA coding, because basically that's what you get to look at when you look at your chart is your genetic code, but it's presented in a way for moms to be able to raise their children with that uh, human design is a duality. Yes, you look at the map, you look at all these numbers and all the stuff and it looks really complex and it's not not complex, but what you need to know about yourself is actually very direct and simple and it's really a mechanical system, right? So I am just a mechanic, I have a large tool uh, belt in terms of being able to administer this information. I know all the levels and I have the talent to be able to synthesize the information in a way that hopefully when you sit down with me, you're going to hear what you need to hear about yourself and a way forward in terms of your next decision. So starting with the four types, we're going to look at the generator, which you can see in the graphic, the square that's colored in, in the bottom, second from the bottom. If you look at your chart, if you have your chart and that's colored in, you're a generator or the subtype, the manifesting generator. And so we were talking about strategy. The strategy for all generators is to wait to respond. In a sense, you have this energy, it's built into you. It has a vibration frequency because that sacral center, that square, is the life-giving motor. It's the source of all life. This is the center of reproduction. And so if you have this defined in your chart, excellent, Taylor, if you have this defined in your chart, then you're a generator. And you could be a subtype, which means that there's other things going on besides what you're seeing in this connection chart as a manifesting generator. But what this means is that you wake up every day full of energy. And the goal isn't necessarily to work. What I like to say is like, I'm not into work, but I do have to release my energy completely every day to the point of exhaustion and collapse. In a sense, I'm here to pass out. So the goal is, is to release all your energy completely to the point of exhaustion, but you don't release it by having to work. You release it because you're doing things that are satisfying to you because that's the signature of the generator with their open and enveloping aura. They have a vibration frequency, all generators, almost 70% of the planets. So 5 billion people have this vibration frequency that's part of their aura their electromagnetic field that we all possess. And that's something to really take in is that we all have this aura and it emanates from our body. We are electrical in nature, right? Your eyes take in electrical signals in order to process information. So we have this electrical system and it produces an electrical field, your EMF field. And so what we like to say in human design is if you allow yourself, your aura is here to do all your heavy lifting for you. All you're here to do is allow it. So for the generator, as opposed to initiating action, it's about being in response. Life flies at you. You're on a planet flying at a very high rate of speed, yet we live in an illusion that we're sitting still where nothing could be further from the truth. So in the, in the theory that life is always flying at you, it's really about discerning how to decide which this or that is for you because it's always a choice. There's always a this or that. So you have this open aura that's here to receive. It's, it can't really block anything. And it envelops its entire environment as it's taking in information. And for the generators, they have a built-in noisemaker. This is the voice of sounds, the original voice, uh -huh, uh -huh. So if you're a generator, it's really more about your noises in response to stuff. In a sense, all generators are best served with yes or no questions as opposed to an open-ended question. It's not like, where do you want to eat tonight? And trying to make a mental decision with an open-ended question, it's better to start off with like, are you hungry? Do you want to go out tonight? And then do you want to go here? Uh-huh, uh-uh. Do you want to go there? Uh-huh, uh-uh. And that's how the generator is best served in terms of releasing their energy 
And so it's to see that their signature is to be satisfied, but who they're not, what we call the not self aspect, is frustrated. So in the generator world, the movement is to go from frustration towards satisfaction through your uh -huh, uh uh process with your open enveloping aura that can't block out anything, but it has the capacity to respond to whatever comes into its aura and to train your own mind to hear your own body in response. You can only teach yourself who you are. And so human design in, invites you to begin the experiment of testing this information. So the next type, the projector has a very different kind of aura. They have what's called a focused and absorbing aura. And you can see that that square second from the bottom is no longer colored in, that only the generators are sacral defined. All the other types have an open sacral center and the generators being 70% of the planet, we are the major moving force, the frustration that a lot of people are experiencing is brought to you by the generators. And to see that we are the ones that are here to do the heavy lifting. I'm a generator, I'm an emotional generator. So it's my job to release energy. It's my job to get exhausted, not the projector. The projector is here to see the energy. That's the, the biggest difference between the generators and the other types is that the generators have the energy and the other types need access to energy because we can't survive without it. So the projector has a unique situation. They're roughly 20% of the population and they're here to wait for the invitation to be recognized and invited. And through the observation of who recognizes them and when you see the chart, what's defined in the chart, what's colored in in the chart, that's what they're here to be recognized for. And if they understand the nature of what their chemistry is and they can see if people recognize that as them, then they have the first indication that potentially those people are for them. And then they are here to guide the energy because they don't have a built-in uh-huh, uh-huh. Only the generator does. Only the generator has what we say is a built-in GPS and it's, it makes a noise. So the generator is lucky in that sense if they can just hear their own noises in response, now they have their opportunity to really start to follow themselves. So the projector is here to understand the nature of energy and how it moves. So the generator is here to recognize the projector as somebody that can see them, recognize that they have this energy. And once the generator invites the projector, then the, the projector focuses directly in on the identity center, the G center you want to, the G center. So what the, the projectors are always focusing in on the identity of this is the center of love and direction. They center in on their directional aspect. And the limitation is that projectors can only focus on one aura at a time where the generators take in everybody because of their open enveloping aura. It's the biggest difference. And since the projectors and the other types as we go through have an open sacral, they are not here to expend the energy to the point of exhaustion and collapse. They are not here to pass out. That's what we really see is that it's really healthy for the generators to pass out and it's really unhealthy for the projectors to go to that point because they uh, have limits in terms of the way they are designed to interact. They are here to be the managers, the administrators, the orchestrators, but not necessarily to do the heavy lifting. Uh, it just, by, just by percentages, there's one projector for three generators. And that's really kind of what the future is about, this 90% of the population, those that see the energy and those that are the energy. Because if you have the energy, you can't see it because you're in it. But if you're the projector, that's all you see is the energy. And what most projectors see is how inefficient people are how wasteful they are with their energy. But when they try to initiate, when they don't wait to be invited, when they try to tell people, hey, you're doing this in an inefficient way, Let me, why aren't you doing it this way? They meet resistance. So it's to see that even though they're obviously have this capacity to see the inefficiency 
They really are here to wait to see who invites them because if they just initiate it, they're going to be wasting their time and their process. So the projectors are designed for one-on-one -on -one interaction in terms of uh, how they can be successful, right? Because just one more point about the projector, just go back one. The projectors not self theme is bitterness. The bitterness of not being invited, of not being recognized. So the goal for them is to go to the signature of success. And the success is about getting the energy to operate in a way that is more efficient because if they can get it to be more efficient, then they can get a piece of that action. Then they get access to that energy, which they don't have their own source of that all generators do, okay? And then we go to the manifestors. Manifestors are roughly 9% of the population. They have a very unique strategy, which is to inform because unlike the generators where it's natural for them to wait to respond for the projector, where it's natural for them to wait for the invitation to be recognized and invited, the manifester has what we call an unnatural or a learned behavior pattern because the manifester is designed to initiate action on the physical plane, to, to be able just to do things. That's Nike, just do it. That applies to manifestors. And the whole world has been taught to manifest their lives. And that's really only applies to 9% of us. So we can see why there's such a, a challenge for us as human beings, because people are not taught to wait to respond or to wait for invitations, but everybody's taught to manifest, to take their lives into their own hands and go for it, just do it. So the manifester kind of like has had their job taken away from them by everybody else because we're all taught to be them, but the manifester has this capacity to initiate action because they have what we say is a motor. Here it's exemplified as the ego motor connected directly to the throat center without the sacral center being defined. In a sense, if this chart had the sacral center defined to another center, then this would be a manifesting generator, the combination of the two types. So the manifester has energy directly connected to the throat without the response motor being involved. I don't wanna to get too complicated here. And so they're here to initiate action on the physical plane. But if they initiate stuff and don't inform other people of what they're initiating, then they get punished because they just do things. They just walk out of the room. They just take the action and people get uh, upset about that. And that's what makes them angry. Manifestors not self theme is anger. And they get angry because they get punished for initiating. So something they're here to learn for the other person so that the other person just gets out of their way is if they just tell them what they're going to do before they're going to do it, then they don't get punished. And it's just informing. They don't have to get permission. They can just say, I'm leaving now. You know, I'll be back or whatever. They can walk. Just don't walk out of the room without saying anything. Saying, I, I got to go, that's enough. And then you leave, then you don't meet resistance because the nature of their aura is so different. It's the opposite of the generator, the open enveloping aura that takes in their own, the whole room and is vibrating where the manifester and projector and the next type we'll see, they're all still in their own aura. They don't put out a vibration frequency. The generator is an energy type that has this energy that needs to be released through response of life coming at them. The manifester is here to initiate the action and their aura is closed because they are very self-contained. So they have a pushy aura. The projectors and generators are very integrated. The openness with the, with the absorption of the, of the projector, has a real symbiosis where the manifestors are kind of like sharks. They're really on their own. So they actually have a, a pushy aura. They push other auras out of the way in this closed and repelling way, but they're very self-contained. Uh, Ra, my teacher, he was a manifester. He initiated this information into the world. If it came through somebody like me, a generator, who's here to wait to respond, it probably wouldn't have gotten into the world, but he could, in a sense, inform others, hey, this is good information. 
if you want to get a reading, you know, ask the generator, inform the generator and then ask them, you know, human design is in the world. It can be really helpful. You should, maybe you should try it. And they're 9% of the population. And then the last, uh, the most rare of all the types is the reflector. The reflector is completely open. They have no definition in their chart. It, is, it would appear that they're very vulnerable, but they're actually not because of the nature of their aura. Their aura has a resistance capacity to it. So it has a bit of a Teflon, so it can take bites and then retreat into their own process. And they become very disappointed in life because of the nature of the homogenized world, the lack of originality that people express, that people are living homogenized conditioned lives. And what we say in human design is we're all living out other people's lives. We're not really living out our own lives because we live through what we're not, where we're open, as opposed to who we are in that sense. And that's what human design is here to orient you to who you are and start to see what is consistent and reliable in you. And that the reflectors process is really attached to the moon that the moon in terms of its movement goes around that wheel, the 64 gates and all six lines of the 64 gates, which is a total of 384 positions every 28 days. So the moon is the only thing that's really consistent and reliable for the reflectors. So they can base their consistency as to who they are based on this lunar cycle. So what we say is that the Reflectors aren't really attached to the to people at all. You know, generators just want to know about themselves. How do I get this energy out? Projectors are interested in everybody else. Why are they making those decisions? Uh, the manifester just wants to let out, do their own thing in their own way and be left alone to whatever degree, or, you know, only be, have people that are into their trips. Where the reflectors are kind of watching the whole show. They are much more attached to the universal aspect of, of the cosmos than to anybody. So what we say about generators, you're here to really study yourself. Projectors are here to learn the system because they're here to be able to identify who's ever in front of them. The manifestors, you guys do what you want. You know, you, you just let us know what you're into. And yes, of course, you're gonna benefit from an education to understand how things work. And the reflectors are interested in everything. So they are here to go from the not self theme of being disappointed to the self theme of being surprised because it's always a surprise when something original happens. And I didn't say about the manifester uh, signature, which is they get angry because they get punished for just initiating what they're here to initiate. So they actually seek peace. You know, they're into, you know, the makeup aspects of the relationship because they have the fight and then they make up and that brings peace to them. And that's really where they're at is to have the peace. So, so really in this final analysis, it's really about giving your mind something to watch to get it out of making your decisions because that's not what it's designed for. Our minds are for each other as my mind is doing its best to be there for you. But what I'm saying doesn't really serve me. Only for me, my waiting to respond and then riding my emotional wave. I have an emotional inner authority. So here are the, some of the things that human design offers. And of course, strategy for decision-making all of your personality traits, every kind of pattern that exists because the chart is you. I mean, that's what I love about human design is it's all you. You know, when I look at a chart, I'm really looking. I mean, there's nothing more fascinating for me than to sit down with somebody and to go through their chart with them because you're getting to really connect to somebody in a way that we haven't been able to connect to before. Human design is a revealed system. It's not new. It's always been you. Kind of the joke in, in a sense is the first thing about human design is to tell you you have an aura that you've always had from the moment you're born till the moment you die. 
And so this is a way of starting to see what's always been there and a way for you to kind of take advantage of your own chemistry. Let your aura do your heavy lifting for you. So I think that's probably a good place to uh, wrap it up for now and to please give us uh, a shout out, connect to us. We love to work with whoever wants to work with us. We are Zhuji, manifesting generator, me, generator. We are here, ready, willing, and able to respond. Thank you, Stephen, for taking us through that. I'm going to stop sharing, and I see that we do have some things in the chat. Um, just want to make sure that everybody, oh, I see we have a generator in the house. Thanks, Taylor, for letting us know. Um, so normally we've gone through these kinds of things and um, we want to give people the opportunity to ask questions. Um, some of the things that, oh, hi, David, manifesting generator. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Roshina for putting the, that in the chat. Um, Stephen is going to be at Alchemist Kitchen on Friday um, doing mini personalized introductions because what we just did was give you a really, really, really broad overview. Um, yes, the presentation will be shared in a follow up email for all of you guys. And then also this video will be part of it. Um, if you guys have any questions about how we work with people, um, our email will be in it as well, and then a link to be able to work directly with Stephen. And of course, we're putting a little bit of a special code in there for you so that you can get a little bit of a discount. Um, and the readings we do are mostly online. So even if you're not in New York City, we do Zoom uh, readings and uh, the readings are recorded so that you can watch them uh, again in the future if you'd like. Uh, what's the difference between manifestors versus generators versus manifesting generators? Stephen, would you like to answer that? Yes, I would. First of all, I'd like to thank Rashina and Alchemist Kitchen for arranging this. It's really wonderful to see this turnout. I'm very impressed. Um, yes, there are many differences. Uh, generators are here to wait to respond and then through response, uh, make their decisions. Where manifesting generators are a combination of two types. They are here to wait to respond. And then if the response is clear in terms of whatever their inner authority is, then the manifester part of them can take over. In a sense, we say generators are very step by step by step and manifesting generators skip steps. They run ahead of the generators. And the key in that situation is to know what is skippable and what is not skippable. Because if you skip the wrong step, then you might not wanna go back and correct it and quit. Where generators get frustrated in the middle and quit Manifesting generators skip ahead, get to the end, realize that they didn't complete it correctly, and then quit. Uh, and the manifestors are really different than the manifesting generators and generators because they just have a completely different aura. Uh, what I say to manifestors is, or to manifesting generators is, you know, you really think, and, and Juji might be able to, you know, experience has experienced this is that the manifestor part really wants to run the show it always does because it has direct access to expression or the throat or initiation through expressing and that's where words become deeds through the thyroid through your throat so you but you still have the sacral motor and the sacral motor dominates in terms of the decision making process so you're here to wait to respond first and then let the response start the process. And once the response gives the thumbs up, then the manifestor aspect of your chart can move cleanly. And, and the manifestor 
is so different that if you're a manifesting generator and you're hanging out with a manifester long enough, you're going to see for yourself that you're definitely not a manifester. They just have a completely different frequency. First of all, the manifesting generators vibrate because they're a generator. Manifestors don't vibrate. They have a completely different frequency. I mean, I, in my first experience uh, meeting Ra and uh, Alak, who is the head of Spain, human design, two manifestors, um, and I got to very first time I was in their aura, man, I could really feel like, I, I don't feel stuff so much, but I could really sense that there was something different about these guys compared to the way I was experiencing myself. So this initiating quality, this closed and repelling aura, uh, my experience has been with groups of people and I was with a group and another group and after the other group left and I'm with my group and I would hear some people that, you know, they don't really know human design. And I, I kind of knew everybody's charts that they would pick out like one person of the other group that says, you know, they were nice and there was nothing, you know, to specific, but I just couldn't really connect to them. Like they were seemed to be holding back something. I was like, ah, yeah, that's what you were experiencing from the manifester because of the closed and repelling aura that they were totally lovely outwardly you wouldn't see that they you know there's anything specific to point at it was just their frequency and that's what human design reveals is the frequency right my voice this is the frequency of my voice going into your eardrums well your aura is a frequency it's in the sound and there's a vibration frequency within our all our auras that we're always taking in i mean you're born as soon as you know you we've all been taking in each other's auras from the moment of birth so we just haven't had a mapping system to be able to discern the difference because it's, you know, it's subtle. We're, we're very homogenized just as human beings. And so here we're kind of peeling away a layer that's always been there, but we haven't been able to discern. And that's what human design offers that opportunity to start discerning things. Is there another question? Uh-huh. Is that, did that satisfy the person who asked, I hope? Jennifer says, ah, that's a great explanation. She says, yes. Okay, great. I also like to joke that manifesting generators are generators with a jet pack. Because <laughs> once that sacral response is clear, we're just like boom, boom, boom ahead. Um, so there was an overarching question about what if you don't have accurate birth time or you don't have your birth time, what is the recommendation then? And then we have another generator follow-up question. Okay, well, if you were born in this country, your local municipality, your town hall has to keep a time on record it's uh, the the department of live births and it's for census purposes so it's not required on your birth certificate and uh i didn't have it on mine either um but some do some don't so if you're born in this country go to your local municipality where you were born department of live births they will have a time it might not be that accurate but it'll give you a, a, a much better indication than none at all. The other recommendation is Vedic astrologers do rectify your time prior to giving you a reading. So I wouldn't say go to a Vedic astrologer and say, hey, I'm doing human design. Can you verify my time? No, go to your Vedic, have them verify it, get the reading, and then come to human design. And the way we do it is uh, I can look at your moon position. There's 12 lines that are associated with the moon and the moon moves ra rather quickly. So uh, if you know the day and if you know, you know, morning or after morning or evening or, you know, or not at all through the moon, there is a way to zero in based on your personality traits that the moon uh, reveals in terms of the Ray V. Ching, the book that we use in terms of reading a chart. So that's, that's, those are three ways, but the best way is to go to your town hall and see if it's on record there. 
Yeah, I just want to add that um, if your birth certificate doesn't have it, it means you don't have a complete birth certificate. Right. Sometimes those are the ones that are issued. So um, that's... Yeah, so you can get a complete one as well, right? Mm-hmm. And I guess to follow that up, not because somebody asked this, but um, because this comes up for as questions for me all the time is like, how important is birth time? And the answer is very, <laughs> um, because a lot can change over the course of the day, you know, um, like really major factors in your chart. So the time is very, very important. Yeah, it's to understand that when you're looking at a young one of them, you know, you, everything about human design to me is really fascinating. So one of the things that are so fascinating is it shows you where the planets live within you. There's nine centers from your head down to your root. So your sun earth position is makes up, makes up 70% of who you are. So if you see where 70% of you resides, for me, it's in my root center. So most of who I am is adrenally based. Some people are Ajna based or head based, the exact opposite of mine. So the reason birth time is so important is because everything is moving. And the moon is the fastest moving object. It goes through 384 positions in 28 days. So the more accurate the time, the more accurate we're going to be able to see those positions. And when you get into the deeper information, which is called color, tone and base, uh, those positions can move as quickly as seven seconds at the base. It changes the position. So we don't really look at that because hardly anybody's going to have something that accurate. But when we get into food and environment and things of that nature, there's positions that move every 40 minutes. And that's where, you know, that's where it's really good to zero in. Like a quick anecdote is I had a client, she had a baby. She gave me a birth time that was three minute variation, right? And I looked at the chart because she wanted to hear about the food and we're not going to get into food tonight. So don't go too crazy about food after I say this. <laughs> but the child was like a year and a half old and she gave me this three minute window. And in that three minute window, it went from hot to cold. So I said to her, look, you know, the child isn't going to make intellectual decisions about eating. So just give her the opportunity to have hot food or cold food. Let her choose what, you know, which, which way she goes. Well, the child went cold with every decision throughout the day. So I was very comfortable in saying, well, your child clearly is, uh, likes cold food over hot. Mm -hmm. And so that was one way I could rectify that chart. I've also had people that were, again, small windows of time, and they went from a projector to a manifester. And just by talking to them and hearing their life experience, it became very obvious that they weren't the manifester and they were clearly a projector. So there's all these different ways, you know, that I can do it because of, you know, how I can analyze a chart. Um, but officially before you come and get a reading, you know, these are the other options. Thank you, Stephen. That was very thorough. Um, I, I feel like this is a great question because it comes up a lot. Taylor asks, as a generator business owner, I'm struggling with the weight to respond in how to reach clients. Hmm. Um, can you speak a little bit to how that works in terms of maybe not just sitting in your room <laughs> waiting by the phone? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that, that, that is the challenge because as we say, it's a not self world. We're all taught to initiate, you know, you can't uh, wait to be invited to go eat. If nobody, you know, if the invitation is there because your stomach is growling, that's the invitation. And what we say to generators, well, you can ask to be asked. In a sense, that's what advertising is. You can put the ad out there and then they respond to the ad and now you're in response. So you can give them like, for instance, like if I have friends who are generators and they want to turn on their friends or family to human design. And I was like, well, you know, if you tell them about it, you're going to meet resistance because you're not here to initiate. You're here to respond. Well, how do I guess? Like, well, you know, put a chart out, get your print your chart up, put it on the table and wait to see who asks you about it. 
And if they don't ask you, then, you know, that's your answer. They're not really interested. You know, you don't have to initiate this action and then meet resistance because you're trying to sell them. You know, the best way to sell somebody is not to sell them in a way, you know, make them want it, right? Make them identify, right? what, what are we, what do we say in business that we want to create this emotional attachment, right? This emotional bond to the product, that they have an emotional vested interest in what you're selling. So it is about being clever to whatever degree, get your word out there, but instead of like trying to actually grab and say, hey, hey, you know, you should really do this. I mean, I, I live that forever in a sense of meeting this information, thinking that if I told my friends and family, they'd be so happy that I'm bringing this to them. And, you know, they, they just weren't having it. They really thought I was, you know, off on some <laughs> cult tangent and they I only got met with resistance. So, you know, I, I've, I learned along the way and again, depending on your other factors of your chart. A lot of people are trial and error people. They can only learn from making mistakes, those kind of things. So it's okay in a sense to measure. That's all we're doing human design is measure. Measure where the resistance is. Measure where the frustration is. Measure where the satisfaction is. You know, if you're a generator and you're just releasing energy, it's not work. You're just getting this energy out that you have to get out because you wake up like a fully charged battery every single day. The goal is to dispense the energy out of that battery, drain it completely because if you try to recharge a half charged battery, you're ultimately com com uh, compromising the life of the battery. So it's to really see that when you're trying to initiate and you're working, you know, that's frustrating potentially. It's not that satisfying. Uh, but when you're just in your groove, like for me right here, right now, this is like my ultimate way of releasing energy. I mean, nothing is less work for me than to have this big a room of people and being able to talk about human design. Can I just add something to what you're saying? Because there is like sort of a follow-up question from Roshina, um, which is what if you are a generator, but you want to initiate your own business? Is that the same thing? And I feel like what we were sort of saying is like, if you have your own business and you are a generator, then the marketing piece of it is where you're putting yourself out there you're asking for people to respond to what you have to offer, but like literally starting your own business is an initiation. So can you speak a little bit to that in terms of what it means to like actually open up a business as a generator? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like, how did the business start? Like for me, human design, definitely came to me and I resisted it a lot. And that was actually <laughs> in, in, in hindsight as an emotional person that's here to be hard to get. I was very hard to get when this first came into my awareness. So I can look back and feel that I entered into human design correctly as myself, even though I had no idea that that's what was happening at the time. So it's to kind of go into your review of how this business really got off the ground and did you really enter into it in response did somebody bring you into it was there something that your bot you know however it started in terms of that but now that you're in it and you're to what see generators are always stuck <laughs> right i'm stuck doing human design at this level in this apartment in this city it's just the nature of being motivated to keep moving forward. So all generators are always stuck in whatever gear and then they want to get into the next gear and then they're stuck in that gear. And that, and that, and just understand being stuck is a motivation to keep moving because life is movement, right? Everything is moving. So, you know, the water moves, if the water doesn't move, right? It, it goes acidic. If, if the air doesn't move, you're right, you're constantly breathing, your blood is flowing. 
the planet is moving. So we're all having life and movement coming at us. So it's really about just discerning as life flies at you, what is correct for you? So how did that business fly at you? Or did you think it up in your head and then say, I'm going to do this? Because that's what the mind does. We've all been taught to use our minds to run our lives where the mind isn't, the mind has one job. It's to be an outer authority. My mind for you, your mind for me. But we've all been taught to use our mind in a dual authority as an outer and inner authority. Not only am I going to be an authority for you, but I'm going to be an authority for myself because that's what we're taught. You know, that's, it's nobody's fault in that sense. But eventually over time, especially as you get older, you know, you go to school, you have a career, but then you quit the corporate job and then you do, you know, whatever kind of healing work or whatever, because you can't, you couldn't take that structure anymore. But mentally you were spot and sold from a young age, you know, to make mental decisions and to understand that human design gives you a lot of permission for growth because it says it takes 50 years to grow up. And if you're not 50, you're not there yet that it takes 50 years of collective memory to really understand your purpose and your role in life. And that's what the chart kind of shows you is your job description. And that, you know, everybody wants to do their job, but they don't know what the job is, right? Everybody wants to, you know, to to do what they're supposed to do, but it's kind of a, you know, it's a cruel joke that people say to each other, well, just be yourself. Well, like, but who is that, you know? (laughs) I'd love to, I'd love to be myself, but I don't really know what that is. Well, here's a mapping system and it's not a belief system. You have to prove this to yourself. You can only prove to yourself that the chart is correct. It's the only thing in human design that is provable. Everything else, like the cosmic nature of how this came into the world and all these other things that you learn about in human design, not provable. They're stories, but your chart with you and you experimenting with it, that you can prove. So, you know, depending how old you are, depending how long you've been in your business, you know, there's all these factors. Of course, what does your chart say? You know, are you at your Saturn return, which is at 30, your Uranus opposition at 40, your Chiron at 50? You know, these are all these things that are part of meeting human design because when I do a reading, I'm gonna cater to you based on where you are in your process. If you're 30 or if you're 15 or if you're 30 or if you're 40 or you're 50 or if you're over 50, that's where you're going to be met, right? Because human design, we start you at what's called the line level, which is on the surface where we're all living, like, like an actor has lines, right? In a script. Well, you have your lines. It's in the, it's in the book. They're written down and you can see your lines. But the cool thing is, it isn't about studying your lines and then saying them, it's about to hear that, oh, these are the lines I've always been saying my whole life. Now I get to see where they come from. Um, I just want to make sure that we don't miss anybody's questions, Stephen, because we have yes. about five minutes left. Um, I also want to round out what you were saying because you mentioned it, but I feel like I want to pause and sort of marinate in the idea that any business that anybody owns is really like here to be in response to a need. Like that's the foundation of having a business is seeing that people need something and then responding to it instead of what you said, which was thinking it up with your mind and then initiating it as a generator. So that felt like a a really important distinction Thank you for the wealth of information. Great clarity. Thank you so much. Um, Do you recommend any books that can help learn more about reading your profile? Um, Well, yes, there are. There is the definitive book of human design, which is an important aspect of learning pretty much everything there is to know about the system. Um, One of the things that we are really passionate about is creating a space for people to learn human design that aren't necessarily here to be certified. 
And so uh, we created Genetic Yoga uh, on Patreon, which is a subscription. And for $20 a month, you can learn anything and everything about human design. Um, we have weekly workshops that Stephen runs, and I have discussion groups that I run on uh, Sundays. And so it's also an amazing place to get a lot of human design content. And we called it genetic yoga because it's the practice of being you. Uh, human design starts with the reading. It starts with you really being initiated into your exper experiment by a professional. And then it's about integrating everything that you learned in that first session over a period of time. So if you're interested in having your chart read, that's what today's offering is about. And then if you wish to continue studying yourself, basically, then genetic yoga is the practice that you can enter into because everybody deserves time and space and uh, assistance in integrating the system. So hopefully that answers your question. You're yes. so welcome. Yeah, and uh, go to YouTube and plug in Ra Aruhu. Listen to Ra, he, he was very generous, my teacher, with free information. So R-A-U-R-U. -R -U I just put it in the chat. There you go. Just Google him, he, his, uh, his website, which you can find through that Jovian archive. Um, there's a free media library, so you can go right to the source and hear very concise descriptions of all of many of the levels of this information. And so our job is to, you know, tailor it specifically to your chart, right? So you can really begin your experiment about what it says directly about you. In a sense of reading, we say we cover the four views. And tonight we covered one view, which is your aura. So there's profile, as you said, that's another view. Your authority, which is where you know if the decision is correct for you. And then your definition, which shows you how that chart is kind of configured in general, how many parts there are to you, so to speak. And, um, and so I'm looking forward to really now that we're hopefully coming out of this isolation, the interesting thing for me in terms of this pandemic was the six foot distancing because that's an aura separation, right? You have an aura, I have an aura. It's your two arm lengths and my two arm lengths. So this four arm lengths between us is where we have this contact. So if you're within that, if you're less than that near somebody three feet away, you're having an, a, a genetic conversation. Your auras are talking. And so as we move into the future, what I'm really interested in is to get back into the live experience because that's where you really learn. You know, you can take in the information and study it and have the working knowledge, but you only really see it when you're with somebody else, when you're actually living it. And that's where the fun is, is living it and actually starting to, not, you know, I mean, to the way you get to learn about yourself and then another person, I mean, this is the ultimate level of respect that you could ever experience for yourself. First, respecting yourself, loving yourself, and then how to respect this other person who could be very different from you. And to see how do you respect me, how to respect you, and how do we, how does this relationship, and that's, you know, again, it's for moms to raise children with, or who you're with in your life, who lives with you, right? How do you get to know them in a way that you can actually be compatible, like truly compatible on whatever level that relationship is, business, friendship, marriage, whatever. I mean, it's really amazing opportunity here for all of us. Absolutely. And of course, you'll be at Alchemist Kitchen, so people can have an auric conversation with you if they are in New York City if they happen to be. Um, Roshina, it is seven o'clock on the dot. How do you feel about us wrapping? Is that good? Great. She says- We answered, we answered the questions. <laughs> that was amazing, yeah. she says. 
You guys did so well. Thank you so much. You were so well. We'll have to back for another. I mean, I feel like we're just scratching the surface, which is great. Absolutely. Right. And I mean, part of the future is, right, we've all been like, had this social interruption in terms of the way we have done things. And my perspective is as we come out and move into the future that we can have this opportunity to come out in a way that's really clean in terms of understanding ourselves and understanding the nature and how we're here to really interact moving forward into whatever the future is bringing to us. And I don't think anybody would argue with that it's things are really changing on this planet. I mean, the pandemic, obviously, that affected everybody, but all the other things that are going on that we're all watching in terms of the way the world is turning. And this is going to be important stuff for you as an individual to know, to survive, you know, to have a, a future that, you know, learn how to trust yourself, right? My job is to hopefully make you the most important interesting thing you know about life and you can't wait to wake up and just see what happens because you can trust yourself no matter what flies at you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. You're so welcome. And um, the follow-up email is on its way, I guess. Thank you for having us. All right. Yes, thank you again. You're so welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much, guys. Love it, love it, love it. Everyone will receive it tomorrow, the email. Awesome. Ciao for now. Thank you so much. Thank you.